Thank you, thank you. What a fun video, huh? It's so good to be with you here today. Early this morning, I drove in and the sun was coming up and it was between two buildings, you know, like that Stonehenge thing, it was gorgeous. Now you're at the later service, maybe you didn't know the sun came up, but it came up um, earlier this morning and it was really spectacular. Before we start, um, it occurs to me that all of us have had a week. I don't know what kind of week you've had. We all have a story that we bring in when we come to church. Um, maybe like most of America, your brackets are busted. Mine certainly are. If you don't know what that means, ask somebody. Um, but I do hope that you have uh, not, that that's like your only issue. Um, maybe that's the worst challenge. I, I think for many of us, we struggle and we come into church and we wonder, you know, well, I got to recover from this past week. Or maybe you've had a week when you've really been flourishing. Either way, I'd like to lead us in a moment of breathing and then prayer so that we can be fully present here right now with whatever it is that God is hoping and choosing to do. So let's start with a deep inhale and a very slow exhale. One more time, deep inhale. Slow exhale. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, we don't have to ask you to be here. You are present. We've already sensed your presence in this room. But sometimes we are not very present. And so we ask that you would help us to set aside our concerns, set aside what we're going to do later today, any details and logistics in our life, and just show up for you right now. Pray that we'll be open to whatever your Holy Spirit might have for us, that we will receive it, and that we will listen and then respond. Thank you so very much for your love and your goodness. It's been so good to sing about that today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, recently I read a blog post from a senior pastor who has set an actual date when he's going to be turning uh, over the reins to a, a new leader. It's all a good thing, but he has a date set for this summer, and the post was titled, Running Out of Sundays, because this man realizes that he only has a certain number of Sunday sermons left to teach. And it made me imagine, what would it be like if Pastor Jarrett and Jeannie came to me and they said, okay, Nancy, you have just one more message to give to Soul City. Teach whatever you feel compelled to teach. What would I choose? There's two or three candidates that come to mind, and what we're going to explore today is one of them. I feel a great urgency on this subject for today. I'm not saying it will be my best message, but I think it's a very important message, and it's all about rhythm. So today we're wrapping up our series, This Transforming Life. For many weeks now, we've been trying to understand what does it look like to live a transformed life. And if you've been to Soul City for even a minute, you've heard our mission. You heard it today. In fact, I think we should try to say it together. Why do we exist? To lead people, go with me now, to lead people into a... Tra you got it. Into a transforming relationship with Jesus. Very good. A little wimpy on the delivery, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, when we celebrate baptism around here, you'll see some of the team with T-shirts that say, this is what transformation looks like. So I have a question for you. How is transformation going for you? How is it going? What does it actually look like? The best description that I can find in the Bible of a transformed life is found in Paul's letter to the Galatians. He describes what he calls the fruit of the Spirit. Take a look at these words. What is the fruit of the Spirit? It is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, transformation doesn't happen overnight, but over time, if you and I are not becoming more loving, more joyful, more patient, more self-controlled, something isn't right. We aren't bearing good, healthy fruit. Have you ever met someone, and sadly I have, someone who claims to be a follower of Jesus for many, many years, and yet without sounding too judgy, you feel like there's so much anger in that person 
or a lack of joy and vitality. They may know a lot about the Bible, but they don't really act like what you might expect of a Christian. Jesus once said, you can tell a tree or a person by their fruit. And I've been thinking about trees a lot lately. This is actually a branch of a small maple tree that we planted in our yard a few years ago. Now, it may not shock you that there are no buds or leaves on this right now because we're coming out of winter. However, for the last couple years, this tree has sported no buds, no leaves. It is dead. A few yards away, there's another tree that's flourishing. I can't wait to see that blossom soon. But this one, we've given up hope on. And we think there's something wrong with the root system or the ground below it because this is the second tree we failed with in that spot. I'm reminded of these words in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. Take a look at this, comparing us to trees. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. I don't know about you, but when I compare myself to a tree, I want to be a healthy tree in my life. I want to be the kind that flourishes, like these beautiful trees. Look at these. They have blossoms and fruit and leaves. They look absolutely gorgeous and fruitful. And just as there are certain requirements for a tree to flourish, it's true for you and me. It's not gonna just happen. If I could sum up our entire series on transformation, this is how I would sum it up. We will not drift into transformation. It must be intentional. I think Dallas Willard said that first. We will not drift into transformation. Transformation is essentially a partnership between us and God. And we can count on him to do his part, I promise you. But there's also a significant part that you and I can choose to play so that we can receive God's wisdom and guidance and comfort and abiding love. My question for all of us today comes out of a recent book by Ruth Haley Barton about work and rest. She asks this, how do I want to live so I can be who I want to be? How do I want to live so I can be who I want to be? Do I want God's presence and transforming power enough, badly enough, to order my life around that, to actually rearrange my life. Now, Jesus himself modeled this for us when he lived here on earth. So I invite you to grab a Bible. If you're in the room and there's a Bible in the seat in in front of you, and if you're at home, grab a Bible as well. And we're going to go to the Gospel of Mark. This is page 812 in your Soul City Bibles. And I want to set up the context first for you. Uh, Jesus had one of those very busy days. He had been recruiting his disciples. He healed Simon's mother-in-law. And he did many other miraculous healings all in this one day. So look at how the day ended in verse 32. Mark 1, 32. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town, wow, wow. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. So after this incredibly intense day, Jesus keeps on, even when it's dark, meeting with and healing people. So the next morning, what does Jesus do? Does he sleep in? Not that that's a bad thing, but that's not what he does. Take a look at verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So Jesus had just experienced what we might call a very successful day, right? And Simon wanted Jesus to maximize his growing popularity. In our culture, he would have said, Jesus, make a splash on social media now. And it's time for us to strike while the iron is hot. Jesus, this is your moment. But when Jesus had pulled away to be quiet and still, he decided it was time to shift. It was time to move on. 
Now, throughout the Gospels, we see examples of when Jesus withdrew to quiet places. There was a rhythm to his life, to his days, and he did this as an example to you and me of how we should live. We were designed by God to be in healthy rhythms, day and night, eating and sleeping, darkness and light, working and resting. Warren and I just returned from a uh, vacation in Florida. We've been blessed the last few years to go to the same little island uh, each year on a beautiful beach. And early in the morning, some of the residents and tourists get up while it's still dark and they go to one side of the island to see the sunrise. Now I confess I missed most of those sunrises. Actually, I never went. But (laughs) at the end of the day, on the opposite side of the island, people gather, lots and lots of people, in the sand, some with a drink in their hand, to watch the glorious sun set as it slips down through the horizon. It really feels like a holy moment. Most of the crowd is actually hushed, but occasionally some of them cheer when it hits that moment and applaud. Others have this weird tradition of singing the song, You Are My Sunshine. Well, we were delighted uh, to be in Florida with our granddaughter, Eloise, for several days. Here's just one photo, because I can't resist. I know, right? I have really no great purpose in showing you that, but I have to show you (laughs) what she looks like. But like most little ones, she is at an age where she loves to repeat actions over and over. There was a living room there with some couches and chairs, and she wanted to walk around in a circle on her tippy toes around that over and over and over again. She had a few books with her. She wanted the same story over and over, going on a bear hunt till I was going crazy. She also had a little wooden box, and she was stuffing things into the slots. And when she was done, she wanted to do it again and again. So thinking about Eloise and the sunset reminded me of a beautiful passage by G.K. Chesterton, written years ago. Look at this. He writes, Because children have a bounding vitality, they are in spirit fierce and free. Therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. Our magnificent creator designed our world to be one of rhythms. He does it again and again each day in each season. And he invites you and me to live intentionally, building certain rhythms into our lives as well, especially the rhythm of work and rest. Let's look at one more passage in the book of Mark. Skip ahead to chapter 6. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Chapter 6, verse 30. It says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. I love picturing the disciples excited to tell Jesus how they had been busy, busy, busy doing everything for him, right? Can't you just picture it? And doing good work can be exhilarating and deeply fulfilling. There is nothing wrong with work. In fact, God calls us to work hard and to make a contribution, to use the gifts that he entrusted to us. But work especially too much of it, can be exhausting and draining. Anybody tired here today? Anybody tired? Jesus saw that his friends needed to come away from work world and rest, so he invites them to a quiet place where they can be refreshed and eat a meal and enjoy one another. What are the rhythms, the daily rhythms in your life? We all have them. Essentially, our rhythms are connected to habits or practices that we do every day. In his book, Atomic Habits, James Clear says that ultimately, our habits matter. Why do they matter? Because they help us to become the people we wish to be. 
Real change happens little by little, day by day, habit by habit. Clear goes on to say, I love this sentence, every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. Every action that we take is a vote. Let me give you an example. Let's say I want to be the kind of person who sleeps consistently and well. Then I will have a habit, which I do, of trying to go to bed about the same time every night and getting up about the same time every day. I want to be a person who sleeps well. Maybe you want to be the kind of person who volunteers. And so you show up once a week in a way that you can serve and volunteer because you want to be the kind of person who is not selfish. Maybe you want to be the kind of person who gives generously. So you have a habit of a certain amount of your income going either online or in person here every week to the work of God and maybe to other organizations as well because you want to be a generous person. Now, maybe you react to the name habit negatively. I have a girlfriend who hates that word. You might use a different word. You can call it practice. I know it sounds restrictive, but in reality, habits create freedom. They really do to become the person we want to become. We've been hearing lately about Pastor Jarrett's new habit of swimming. You heard about this? He's talked about it a bit. Yeah, swimming. It reminded me of when I first formed an exercise habit back in college a zillion years ago when running was just becoming a thing. And my college roommate was a runner, and I wanted to follow her example. I wanted to be the kind of person who regularly exercises. Now, at first, I missed a lot. I would make excuses. I have to study or I have to go out with my friends. But slowly and surely, exercise became a habit. No different from brushing my teeth in the morning. In the morning, every day, not every day, six days a week, I get up, I lace up my shoes, and I head to the YMCA. It's no longer a question. I don't say, hmm, should I go today? I just go. It's a lifelong habit. So today, I'm going to challenge all of us to look at a daily habit, one daily habit, and one weekly habit that I believe will be key to our transformation. Absolutely key. Becoming more and more like Jesus. We're going to start with a daily habit. And to illustrate this, I want to come over to this comfortable chair. This daily habit is sometimes called a quiet time. You can call it whatever you want. But it asks us to carve out 10 or 15 minutes a day to be still, to cease our work and our many words, our striving and our stress, our hurry, and our hectic thoughts. I first learned of this practice when I was in high school. I'm grateful that I learned about it that long ago. And like many of you in high school, I was a crazy busy student. I had a lot going on. But I learned that if I would set an alarm and go out into our little family room uh, early in the morning, while it usually was still dark, I could be with Jesus for just a few minutes and kind of orient my day. I remember actually imagining him in the chair next to me, and I would just chat with him, and I would bring him my concerns, and I would let him know how good he is. We just sing that song, all my life, Lord, you've been so, so good to me. You've been faithful. And I would just take a few moments to shift my perspective and focus on him. I'm tender about it because I believe it has shaped me, doing that ever since. Now, how you use this time can vary widely. The first step, though, is to make it a habit. And start small, just 10 minutes. In the morning, if you like, but my husband would say it doesn't have to be in the morning. He's a night person, and he wants you to know God will meet with people at night as well. Okay, so just clear that up right there. But I do think to become a habit, it's important for it to be a consistent time each day. And you may choose different times throughout certain seasons of your life. Maybe you have a job at a certain point that allows you to take 15 minutes on your lunch hour. Or maybe if you have very tiny children. I remember when I was nursing my daughters, and my only time really to breathe and alone with God was nursing them in the middle of the night and just trying to sense his presence with me there and his tenderness uh, in that moment. Many of you today already have a habit of coming back to God for a part of your day, but if this is new for you to consider, I recommend what some experts call habit stacking. 
you build a new habit tied to something you're already doing each day. So for example, after I brush my teeth, I will, or after I get my first cup of coffee or tea, or after I put the little one down for a nap, or after I finish my dinner before I watch television. So it looks like this. After I, current habit, I will, new habit. And at the beginning of each new habit, it's so important to keep it simple. Don't have a goal at the beginning to pray for an hour. I think that would overwhelm you. It helps to have a few rituals, too, um, tied to your habits. Some people, these days, as an empty nester, I'm able to get up and get a cup of tea and go to the couch, and my little dog eventually joins me. Some people like to light a candle as a symbol of God's presence. I urge you to keep your phone at a distance during these minutes. And then what you do with the time really varies widely. In fact, I encourage you to experiment. If you've been doing this for a long time, you know that sometimes you have to shake it up periodically and do some different things. There are times when I would keep a gratitude journal and write down what I was grateful for or do some journaling. It's great to read some scripture and reflect on some verses for a while. Lately, I've been including some minutes of total silence because there's too many words in my life. And I just want to breathe and sense God's presence and remind myself that I'm his daughter. Now, some of you sitting still drives you crazy, so here's another idea. I read a great book called God Walk, where someone daily just goes outside in all kinds of weather and walks and senses God's presence more as they're taking that walk and prays about certain things and notices what God has created and gives praise for it. Solitude has been called the most basic spiritual discipline. Henry Nouwen said that without solitude, it's virtually impossible to have a spiritual life. And so much of our day, we're surrounded by people. It's important to have solitude. One more suggestion, a practice that I use, goes way back to St. Ignatius. It's called the examine. You can think of it as reviewing your day, either in the morning about your previous day, or it can be at night. But you look back at the previous 24 hours, and you reflect on the moments and events. Ruth Haley Barton describes this process and has some tips for us. She says, as you reflect on the events, ask God to show you where he was present with you, even though you may not have recognized it at the time. Ask God to show you the places where you are growing and where you're changing. Thank him for evidence of his transforming work in your life. Ask God to show you places where you fell short of Christ-likeness. Be careful not to succumb to shame or morbid introspection. Instead, simply name your failure honestly. Confess it to God and receive his forgiveness. And then finally, she says, finish by thanking God for the day and for his presence in your life. One day last week, I was doing an examine, and I realized that I had been feeling some jealousy toward another person. And I did feel some shame about that. It felt ugly to me. But last week, Jarrett taught us that what we want to do is come clean. So I came clean to God. I confessed it. I asked for his forgiveness. And then I just felt so much lighter, ready to bear much better fruit. So this is a daily habit. And I believe a consistent time alone with God is the key to transformation, to becoming the person that I say I want to be. And after walking with God for decades now, I can honestly tell you, Any goodness in my character, any goodness, is because of this habit of paying attention to God and giving him space in my life. So how about a weekly habit? Uh, Seven years ago, I had the privilege of teaching here about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is truly one of God's greatest gifts that he's given to humans. I feel like a salesperson for the Sabbath. I just got to tell you, it's awesome because he longs for us to experience a rhythm of working and resting. One day out of seven that is distinctly different from all the rest. God modeled this when he created the universe, and he invites us, actually he commands us, to order our lives in the same way. Now, throughout history, both Jewish and Christian people have messed this up quite a bit and distorted it and wrongly defined what God intended for the Sabbath. They've turned it into a legalistic set of rules and ridiculous restrictions. The Jewish people used to have 39 activities that were forbidden on the Sabbath. 
And the Puritans who came to this country brought with them their own misconstrued picture of a day when they weren't even allowed to smile or kiss their children. Really messed up. Totally missing the intent and spirit of what God wants to offer us on the Sabbath. The Hebrew word for Sabbath actually is translated or means stop. Stop. Now, without being legalistic, there are some activities that we need to cease in order to free us up, right, for other activities. But many of us are way too comfortable with working. We, we feel more comfortable with working than resting. We doubt that we could ever get everything done in six days instead of seven. But here's the deeper truth. Maybe you'll feel an ouch when I say this, and it's an ouch for me. Many of us find our identity too much in our work. That's where we, yeah, that's where we ground our identity. And that needs to be shifted, and the Sabbath helps us do that. I'm learning there's a kind of humility required to stop and to rest. Now, in some Jewish families, they actually have a box where they store things that they're not going to be needing for the Sabbath. What kind of things might be in this box? Well, don't sweat and freak out a little bit, but maybe your laptop and your iPad or your computer Oh, here's another one. How about your phone? Put that in the box. Maybe your TV remote from so much binge watching and everything else. Maybe even your credit card so you don't spend the day consuming and all over the websites and Amazon, etc. Now, those are some tangible things, but there's some intangible things we need to stop on the Sabbath, including... Uh, our worry, our hurry, our anxiety, our stress, our competitiveness. Okay, so if we do that, what the heck are we supposed to do on that particular day? Does it sound a little boring? Oh, no, 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 my friends. It's not boring. We fill the day with whatever is life-giving, whatever brings us delight. We remind ourselves that God is actually wanting to celebrate the week with us. And when I unplug, it is actually an act of resistance, truly an act of resistance against a culture of pushing and earning and buying and worrying. And I can be reminded that God loves me simply for who I am, not for what I accomplish. God just loves me. I'm his daughter. Now, traditionally, Christians celebrate the Sabbath on Sundays, including going to church, If you have to work on Sundays, you can choose a different day. But what does matter is a consistent rhythm. Don't pick a different day every week if you can help it. But six days of work and errands and house stuff and doctor's appointments and all that stuff. And one day of rest and delight. Now, if you're listening to this and you have small children, you want to shoot me right now. You... (laughs) You're thinking, how is that supposed to work with little ones? And I I do get it. But we can begin to model for our children a day that includes worship and fun and family time and rest, maybe even an hour or so where everyone goes in their room, even if it's just a quiet time, to get some rest and unplug, even mom and dad. Perhaps the biggest challenge I want to give you, though, the biggest shift in our thinking is to go offline for at least a portion of your Sabbath. You see, technology can erode our days, our sense of closure to our days. It blurs the lines completely from the have-tos to the want-tos. Put your devices away. The world won't stop, I promise you. And delight in a good book, not a workbook, a good book, a good walk, a good conversation, Design the day to be uniquely different and watch how God refreshes and restores you. Be intentional as you plan for your Sabbath days. And here's a promise if you do that for all of us. This is from the book of Isaiah. God says, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, then you will find your joy in the Lord. You will find your joy. I think of the Sabbath as a present. It's a gift that God wants to give to us every seven days. He's saying, will you trust me? I know what's best for you. The world won't stop. 
if you cease your work and busyness for one day, will you receive this gift? Will you take it? Will you have the courage and the tenacity and the will to say, yes, I will stop one day a week and I will receive this precious gift? It's one of the greatest things that has molded my life is learning about the Sabbath and living it out. Now, as we close, I want to remind us that transformation takes intentionality, right? Every action you take is a vote for the type of person you become. Our lives are truly a series of little choices, tiny little choices, tiny little habits. Look at these profound words from C.S. Lewis, written many, many years ago. This is a longer quote, but I promise you it'll be worth it. So hang with me, okay? This is getting to the end here. Watch this. Every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses into something a little different from what it was before. And taking your life as a whole, with all your innumerable choices, all your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing either into a heaven creature or into a hellish creature, either into a creature that is in harmony with God and other creatures and with itself, or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to one state or the other. We're progressing to one state or the other. And Soul City Church, I want for me and for you to be making the kinds of choices that will make us into creatures that are marked by love and kindness and faithfulness and self-control and all the other fruits of a life invested in being with God and letting him be with us. I challenge you without apology to make the small choices every day to make that transformation possible. Last week, Jarrett challenged us to come clean and come home And this week I want to add, come away, come away. Jesus said, will you come with me to a quiet place and get some rest? Daily, as a daily practice, and once a week as the Sabbath. I promise you that over time, over time, God will shape you if you're willing to commit to these habits. And I want to lead us in a prayer as we close that we could learn to do this well that we would have the will and the tenacity to live in healthy rhythms. Would you pray with me? You might want to open your hands as a sign of surrender in your lap there. Heavenly Father, thank you that you want to be with us. That's astonishing that the creator of this universe actually wants to spend time with us. Father, forgive us for all of our striving for all of our busy, busy, busy activity that all too often distracts us and keeps us away from you. And may we listen now for just a moment to a specific step you might want us to take, either for a daily habit or a weekly habit. I'm just gonna be quiet for a moment, God, and let all of us listen to you for a moment. Help us to hear your voice. And so, Father, God of the sunrise and the sunset, we pray that we will live in the kind of rhythms you designed us for so we can become the men and women that you want us to be. That is our goal, that is our hope, and that is our intent today. In the name of our Savior, Jesus, who modeled this for us, it's in his name that we pray. Amen.